As I was listening to Andrew and Jacob read, I thought of Garrison Keeler and Lake Wobegon, and I thought, yep, this is the place. The men are good looking, the women are strong, and the children are above average. There's just no two ways about it. No two ways about it. The tender mercies of our God, Advent 2, actually. It's technically 3, but 2. We have today the song of Zechariah, which we did in the Advent reading. And that song has elements that seem incomprehensible for the birth of a baby. The difference between what we might say to a child or about a child's birth and what this father spoke seems huge. And yet we want to put it in the context of hope and expectation. Messianic hope and expectation. It was the time when people were looking for a deliverer, for freedom, for one that would come that would save them from their oppression. I want to highlight today something about Jewish spirituality. It isn't very otherworldly. Sometimes I worry that our spirituality is too otherworldly. Sometimes I think we're focused so much on the world to come that we ignore the world that is. Sometimes I think we're so out of tune with spiritual things in general that we don't see beyond the world that is to the world that could come. So it does go both ways. But I invite you to look at the texts with me again. We're going to start in Lamentations because that's an unusual place to start. Lamentations was probably written, at least many of them, by the prophet Jeremiah. At least that's the tradition. We don't know who put them together into one book. Certainly he didn't write it the way it is in our contemporary Bible, cover to cover. But he wrote many of these Lamentations, and in fact, the book of Lamentations is the only book in the Bible that has 100% this genre of literature, Lamentations or Laments. To lament is to cry. We find this genre of literature in all the Old Testament prophets and wisdom literature. It's prevalent in the Psalms, but we don't see it. Any other type of literature, I should say, in Lamentations itself. So why would we be choosing a hymn of lament, a song of lament, a poem of lament, when we're looking for the one who would come. Jeremiah is writing about the destruction of Jerusalem. This jewel, this city of hope, this place in a desert, this place of beauty and comfort and promise, this place located in the ancestral homeland of their forefathers, the Mount of Jerusalem being the place where tradition has it Isaac was taken to be sacrificed by Jacob. This holy place was ransacked and taken, and all of Israel is crying. All of Israel is lamenting. And Jeremiah in his lamentation in 3.22 and follow, which we just read, says this, in the midst of all of his tears, He speaks these words of beauty and comfort and hope. He sees, even in the destruction, the tender mercies of our God. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. It's bad, but it's not over. We've been terribly hurt, but we're not done. Some of us are still here. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. And then in this cry, eyes lift heavenward, and He says to God, Great is your faithfulness. We have a hymn about that, don't you? Great is our, your faithfulness, O God our fathers. I will say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, 
to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. In the midst of crying, hope. In the midst of tears, praise. In the midst of lament, patience. A looking forward. A counting of God's goodness and graciousness and kindness and compassion. And so this points us, if we go now to Luke 1, this points us back to some of the themes in Zechariah's song. Let's read it together, starting in verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now we're speaking not of Jesus' father, but of the father of John the Baptist. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. <coughs> As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, now it goes to the contemporary, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into paths of peace. Almost 600 years later, Zechariah is speaking words that echo lamentations of long ago, only now hope has come. Now there is a presence. But the situation isn't dissimilar. Israel has rebuilt J Jerusalem, but it's occupied. The Romans are there. It's no longer their city. It's a Roman city, a Roman province. It is a Roman who has built the temple at which they now worship, just as it was a different king that destroyed it long before. So as Lamentations mourns what has been the destruction of Israel, I mean Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is now occupied, these two things come through in commonality in the first part of our song. He's raised up a horn, he's elevated, made great, the possibility, the fact of salvation in the house of his servant David. But listen to the refrain that comes through twice, 71, and also again in just a little bit. It says, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, 74, and to enable us to serve him without fear. The earthly spirituality that comes through in these lamentations and comes through in this song of Zechariah is centered around daily life. It's a life that says it is good when we are, we are born, when we live, and when we die. It is good that we have an ancestral homeland, a place to call our own. It is good that we have a temple and a place to worship our God. It is good that we have a place where we know we can be heard where grace can be mediated and where the hope of salvation can be communicated. It is good that we have peace in our land and safety and deliverance from our enemies. It is good when God is with us, for us, beside us. It is good. It is good when our ancestors and God's promises to them are remembered. It's good when our prophets can speak and be heard. And you, my child, will be called a prophet, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. What an honor. What a privilege. What a joy. Second Corinthians, 
takes place a good deal after this time, several years anyway. But in chapter 1, this God of comfort speaks to us again. Out of His tender mercies, we find this song. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul's typical blessing. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Let's just put that into practice for a minute. This blessing that Paul has given is explicitly tied to the coming of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ. We can speak of the God of all comfort in a contemporary way here in Corinthians because Jesus Christ has come, lived, served, died, showed us the Father, given us a clear example of the way to go. The God of comfort now speaks through the life of Christ. The tender mercies of our God are revealed and made known in Him. And it, Paul invites us to live those and share those. So in addition to all the earthly blessings that, the, that Lamentations would seek and that Zechariah's song speaks about in the first part, a homeland, a sense of promise, a sense of belonging, a heritage, a future, not only ancestry, but progeny, fertility in the land, crops and yields of fruits and vegetables, commerce, life, safety, security, very earthly. And we all look for the same things. But in the midst of this, Paul is able to identify for us the source of all comfort. It isn't just in what it is that we've received around us physically. But it is the comfort we ourselves receive from God in Christ. And listen to the irony of it all in verse 5. For just as we share in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, etc. An upside-down sort of relationship to things is established and now we find ourselves receiving comfort in suffering. Christ's and ours for the sake of Christ, that the news of salvation may go forward. This was certainly the experience of John the Baptist. There's no two ways about that. Let's turn to Matthew 9 and take a look at that passage, our new <laughs> gospel reading. Matthew 9. I think that the passage that's printed in the bulletin is not correct, and I'm sorry for that. I will take responsibility for that. I think the one that goes with the sermon I'm preaching today is actually 9, 14 through 17. So let's read that one. John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out, and the wineskins themselves will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. What is Jesus saying? What is he giving us in this? What Jesus gives us in this passage is a reframing of everything that has come before. Jerusalem went through cycles of destruction and rebuilding. Many of the cities in the ancient Near East did. 
There were times of peace and prosperity followed by times of hardship, war, famine, and pestilence. The people of Israel were always God's people. But there were times that they understood themselves to be under God's discipline, and there were times they understood themselves to be under God's blessing. But what changes when we get to this is that we can no longer take this old idea about the tender mercies of our God. The tender mercies of our God now need to be framed squarely in the good news that has come through the proclamation of John the Baptist and in the person of Jesus Christ. John would come as one who would point the way, and Jesus would be the one who, of whom John would say, I am not worthy to untie his sandals. In Christ, we have a new wineskin, and in Christ, we have new wine. We can't keep running before between two systems. We can only now look at the tender mercies of our God through the lens of of what Jesus teaches us about the Father and about who He is. Our spirituality is shaped by Advent in this way. In this season, we anticipate the coming of Christ as He came the first time long ago, and we celebrate and we learn and we grow in that. But we also look forward to a second coming, a second Advent that's implied in this, one in which a new order of things is established forever one in which the old order of things is wiped out and pushed away, one in which the old order of things passes and is no more. I want to invite you this Sabbath day to make this an opportunity for yourself. Allow yourself once again to hope. Allow yourself once again to look for the tender mercies of God even in the hard places of your life. Allow yourself to think with joy about the life that is ours as metaphorically the sun rises upon us every day. It's spelled S-U-N and that is what happens. Today is another glorious day. But it means sun, yes, but it's an allusion to sun, S-O-N. For Christ, the Son of God, our Son, brother, rises every day in our lives and in our hearts, shaping for us a new order of things, creating for us a different, a different place of being, a different center for our lives, and spiritualities. May the Christ child come, and may the tender mercies of our God be yours.